Hey, I'm golf broadcaster Matt Adams. The updated and expanded second edition of my book, The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments, is now available. Readers can expect to march with Arnie's Army at the 1960 U.S. Open, relive Jack Nicklaus's remarkable 1986 Masters win, and be amazed by the Tiger Slam. The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments. Pick it up with fine books sold, including barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to award-winning Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. We are bringing old-school basketball to a new-school audience, and today we bring you the second half of our story on Bobby Plump, the real-life Jimmy Chitwood. And if you listened to last week's episode, we shared how the character of Jimmy Chitwood from the movie Hoosiers is based on Bobby Plump. And just like in the movie, Bobby Plump hit the game-winning shot to secure the 1954 state championship for Little Milan High School in rural Indiana. And when we left off last week, we left off with the team winning the championship and Bobby signing autographs for everyone who wanted one. His hand practically fell off from signing so many programs. He had just become the most famous person in Indiana. Hitting a game-winning shot like that for the state championship will make anyone in Indiana a legend for the rest of his life. And that was certainly true for Bobby Plump. After the game, it is tradition that the Indianapolis Fire Department give the winning team a ride around Indianapolis as fans line the streets to cheer on the new champions. In downtown Indianapolis, they have a famous roundabout and the team gets to go several laps around the circle. It was a great time for these kids and their two coaches. In the movie, this is where the story ends, but in real life, Bobby Plump had much more life to live. After all, he was only 17 years old when he hit that game-winning shot. He had a few more basketball games to play and awards to win. And the first award was winning Indiana's Mr. Basketball. This is the award given to the best player in the entire state for that season. Now, this is not the point of winning Indiana's Mr. Basketball, but winning that award pretty much guarantees paid speaking engagements for the rest of your life. But the other thing that comes with winning Mr. Basketball is getting the privilege of wearing jersey number one for the Indiana All-Star Team, which plays an annual charity game against an All-Star Team from the state of Kentucky. Bobby also played in a few other All-Star games that spring as it seemed that he was practically on a victory tour playing in these special games all over the state. As high school came to a close, it was time for Bobby to choose a university to attend. Now, every university in Indiana wanted Bobby Plump. The most popular school was Indiana University, who was still being coached by the legendary Branch McCracken. However, McCracken wanted Bobby to switch from his one-handed jump shot to the old-fashioned two-handed set shot. That is literally going backward 20 years in terms of style and fundamentals. Bobby wanted nothing to do with the two-handed set shot, so he chose the only school that made sense for him. Butler University. He had been playing for the previous two years in the Butler offense. Now, as I mentioned last week, Bobby's high school coach Marvin Wood played at Butler for coach Tony Hinkle and brought that same offense to Milan. And coach Hinkle was still the coach at Butler. So bringing Bobby in was a no-brainer. He already knew the offense and would fit in seamlessly. Now, here are two quick stories about Bobby's first semester on campus. Now, first, Living at Butler, it was the first time in his life that he had indoor plumbing where he lived. And the, the second story that I found funny was that Bobby was sitting around with some of the other guys where he lived, and one of them said, hey, who wants to go out for pizza? And Bobby said, what's pizza? To make a short story even shorter, he now loves pizza. Now, as far as basketball was concerned, Bobby was exactly what Butler was looking for. He was able to play right away on the varsity at Butler since the school offered no basketball scholarships at the time. This lack of scholarship created an exception that allowed freshmen to play on the varsity right away, whereas most schools had to make their players wait until their second year before they could play on the varsity. Now, Bobby led his team with 13 points a game in his freshman season. However, the team finished with a record of 10 and 14. Now, it was a good start for Bobby personally. He proved that he belonged at the college level. If it hadn't been for a young lady, he might not have ever seen his second year at Butler University. And I'll be right back with that story after this break.
This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of you Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row One catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row One Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes. Hello, sports history fans. I'm Ross from the podcast Pigskin Tales. You're about to jump into another thrilling sports history moment. But first, let's dive into today's sponsor, just in time for the holiday season. Introducing Art of Words, the brainchild of word artist Dan Duffy from Philadelphia. Dan meticulously crafts stunning images by handwriting relevant words from some of the greatest sports moments in time. These unique budget-friendly illustrations are the perfect gift, sparking cherished memories and capturing hearts. Choose from city skylines, sports, history, and musicians to find a piece for everyone. And here's the exciting part. For that sports fanatic in your life, gift them a piece of their favorite team or player's history. Art of Words tells a compelling story. Explore collegiate stadiums, each meticulously crafted with every football victory etched into words. Or venture into baseball stadiums, handwritten with every player from the team's illustrious history. My favorite on the site is Bryce Harper 2021 MVP year. Because I'm a big stats guy, I think that's one of the coolest things ever. Check it out! Don't wait! Order a print today for yourself and your loved one this holiday season. Transform your wall into a gallery of captivating art and surprise your family and friends with a print of their own. Use code SHN15 at artofwords.com for a 15% discount on your order in November and December. Visit Art of Words, where words magically transform into stunning art, evoking cherished memories and touching the hearts of those who you care about. Again, use the code SHN15 for 15% off at artofwords.com. Welcome back to the show, and let's continue with the story of Bobby Plump. As I mentioned, he might not have seen his second year at Butler if it had not been for a date. There was a big dance on campus, and Bobby, along with many of the other students, were enjoying their evening with their dates and having a good time. However, the basketball team had a curfew, and he had to be home at a certain hour. Well, Bobby and his date decided that there would be no harm if they stayed out an hour later. After all, it was a special occasion. And while they were out, the house that he lived in blew up. And I mean that literally. Bobby's room was directly above the basement furnace and there was some sort of an accident and it exploded and completely destroyed that section of the house where Bobby lived. Local firefighters and emergency service personnel were there quickly and everyone assumed that Bobby was still in there because it was already after curfew and Bobby's bedroom had taken most of the damage. The firefighters began to dig through the rubble looking for Bobby and it did not take long for the word to spread throughout the campus that Bobby was still out on his date and not home at all. Thankfully, nobody else was injured seriously. A few of the other guys that lived in that house got some bruises and scratches, but nothing serious. It was a huge relief to the entire campus and it was confirmed that despite the severe damage of the house, 
no one suffered any serious injuries, but Bobby had to find a new place to live. And during his second year on the basketball team, he scored 13 points per game and the team finished with a record of 14 and 9. But this was not enough to make the NCAA tournament. Back then, the NCAA tournament only allowed around 12 teams to participate. Now, as a third year student or a junior, he upped his scoring to 19 points per game and was named the team MVP for that season. However, Butler finished with a record of 11 and 14 and was not able to make any of the postseason tournaments. And that left Bobby with just one season of university basketball left to play. And for that final year, he was able to score 20 points per game. And this time he led the team to the NIT which was still a very prestigious postseason tournament. And this was a big deal for Butler University. In the semifinals of the NIT, which was played in New York's Madison Square Garden, Butler unfortunately lost to St. John's University from New York. And that is how his career ended at Butler. But he was not completely finished with basketball. He had played so well in that final season that he was selected to play in a national all-star game, consisting of the best seniors in the country that year. And he performed quite well, and there was a small chance that he might be able to play in the NBA, but life was changing quickly for Bobby. He met and married his wife Janine, and together they needed to decide which direction to take his basketball career. Now, one option was to try to make an NBA team, but Bobby was aware of his limitations as it pertained to playing at the professional level. Another option was to join a team in the National Industrial Basketball League, or NIBL. The NIBL was technically an amateur league of corporate sponsored teams. That means that each team in the league was to put together a team using full-time employees of the company. So the players were not technically paid to play basketball. They were paid for whatever their regular job was, and they also played on the company basketball team. Now, if I'm being honest, many of these players were hired specifically for their basketball skill, and then the company had to give them a regular job to justify their participation. In the case of Bobby Plump, he was being recruited by the Phillips Oil Company from Oklahoma. Their team was called the Phillips 66ers, and they needed a shooting guard, and they felt that Bobby was a perfect fit. His regular job would be with the recreation department of the company, helping organize company activities for the employees of the company and their families. Now, this is where Bobby had a slight dilemma. In addition to the offer from Phillips, he was also invited for a tryout with the St. Louis Hawks of the NBA. But here was the catch. Even just attending the tryout with the Hawks would nullify his amateur status. He would be considered a professional even if he never actually got paid by the Hawks. Now, based on the roster that the Hawks already had, Bobby was not confident that he could make the team, but he still wanted to play basketball. So his best chance was to do that with Phillips 66ers. He and his wife packed up what little belongings they had and moved out to Oklahoma to join the team there. Now, I want to be clear that the NIBL was a serious basketball league with some serious players. Some of these players had legitimate NBA talent, but this was still the 1950s, and some of these players could make more money working a regular job with the NBL than they could playing in the NBA. So yes, the NIBL had some serious players. Now, it was in the 1960s when the NBA salaries started to really go up to the point that the NIBL began to suffer. All of the best players were now consistently choosing the NBA because of the higher salaries, and the NIBL slowly became less relevant element and the league eventually died out. But anyway, back to Bobby Plump. He played with the 66ers and played quite well for four years. And at that point, nagging injuries began to pile up and he found himself being less effective on the court. And he notified the coach and the company that he needed to stop playing basketball. Now, Phillips, being the company that it was, said that Bobby still had a job with them for life if he really wanted. He was very appreciative and he and his wife had to really think about that. Oklahoma had become home for them in a way. But the draw of all of their family back in Indiana was just too strong. So they decided to head home to Indiana and settle in Indianapolis, where Bobby continued to work for Phillips as part of their sales department. And he was glad to be back in Indiana, but his job had him crisscrossing the state to check up on fueling stations to make sure that everything was okay. It meant being in his car all day, every day, and it eventually wore on him and he left Phillips altogether. 
Then he started his own insurance and financial services company, and the fact that he was the great Bobby Plump helped him to grow his business to great success. He was loyal and dedicated to his clients, and he continued to handle speaking engagements and had established a very solid and comfortable life in Indianapolis. He and his wife were then living within a short distance of each of their families, and life was good for the Plumps. And they had two daughters and one son. And in 1981, he was inducted into the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame, which is an incredible honor for him. But even bigger things were yet to come. And that bigger thing happened in 1986. That was the year that the movie Hoosiers was released. Now, while the film changed the names of the players, the coaches, and even the names of the school, everyone in Indiana knew that that movie was based on the Milan High School 1954 run to the state championship. And interest in the Milan story began anew. Bobby was now handling speaking engagements outside of Indiana. In one case, he was all the way out in California where fellow Indiana native John Wooden was also speaking. Bobby approached Wooden to say hello and as soon as Wooden turned, he said, you're Bobby Plump and I'm glad to meet you. To capitalize further on the movie's release, the Indiana Hall of Fame organized a game between the actual Milan players who were now in their late 40s and the actors who played them in the movie who were mostly in their 20s. Well, despite the Milan boys being twice as old as the actors, the Milan boys won decisively in a very short five minute game. Bobby Plump lived a good life and made friends with most of the other basketball legends from Indiana, including the Robertson family, as in Oscar Robertson. When Oscar's older brother passed away, Bobby Plump was one of the pallbearers. Bobby was also a pallbearer for his own college coach and Hall of Famer, Tony Hinkle. But Bobby continues to be the walking embodiment of the idea that anything can happen in sports. Every team, no matter how small, has a chance. After all, that is why they play the game. In addition to his insurance business, Bobby opened a sports bar and restaurant in Indianapolis called Plump's Last Shot. It's a popular place to watch basketball and often Bobby or his son Jonathan work behind the bar. And beyond that, Bobby even used his celebrity to win a seat to the Indiana State House of Representatives, where he continued to work on behalf of the people of Indiana. Today, Bobby is still with us at 87 years old, and if you're ever in Indianapolis and want something to drink and to catch up on Indiana basketball history, just head over to Plump's Last Shot. And I just love Bobby's story and the Milan Miracle. It is everything I love about sports. On any given day, any team can beat any other team. And there is a natural drama in sports where nobody knows what is going to happen until the events unfold. Bobby and his Milan teammates epitomize that hope. Well, that is it for today. Join us next time when we share the story of another entry in the lost teams of the ABA. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. And if you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announced there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the football history dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned... We're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website, seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sports.com. HistoryNetwork.com.
You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.